welcome to this week's Good Work Show. We are back, your co-hosts. I'm Hello. Elaine Armstrong. I'm Trini Slyons. And uh, we have a really good show for you today. So uh, we are bringing back a real good uh, friend of ours. Yes. Raphael Holloway. And uh, we're, we're calling him a good friend. I hope he, I hope he finds us to be good friends of his. I hope so. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't we'll ask just, him. We'll just claim it. Yeah. But he, um, he is the CEO of Gateway Center. So an organization that is here in the Atlanta, um, in Atlanta, but they are tackling the issue of homelessness and from a couple of different angles. And um, so you might have heard of, of Gateway Center before because they are one of the larger organizations that are working in the space. But uh, you may not know exactly what they do. Right. And so he's going to tell us all about it and well, um, and give us the, some insight. And Nicole mentioned when Back in Our Feet was here, it's one of their starting points. Yes. For their run. Yes. So we talked a little bit about it, um, just mentioning it from that context. So we'll learn actually what. If they actually do there other than start running at five o'clock in the morning. That's right. And Raphael is in my leadership Atlanta class. So yes, he's like so my class buddy. <laughs> he's my buddy. So uh, we'll be really good friends next yes. year. <laughs> so we'll have Raphael done. come back next year and then it'll be a right. whole different. I just won't even participate. I will go. Well, no, we're going to involve else. you in it. We're going to. Hey, it'll be fun. Just as long as we don't show any video of any of the stuff that we have to <laughs> That's Any other performances do. we have to do in there. Yeah. yeah. And then later on in the show, we're going to have Scott Williford, who is the co-founder of The Table on Delk. Uh, and and actually, you know what? The, these two kind of could go because I'm pretty sure there are some people that um, Scott and his wife are serving that may be in very similar situations to some of those that Raphael and his team are serving. But The Table on Delk. Um, is tackling the issue of sex trafficking and human trafficking, particularly um, in a couple of areas um, in hotels on Delk Road. So, uh, so a little bit way away from yeah. where the Gateway Center is located, but at the same time, I, I guarantee there are some similarities in some of those issues. And, and for the the you know the women and men and um, and youth who are being um, victims are. Um, in you know sex trafficking, if they want to get out, they have to have somewhere to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. It's, it's, we do plan this sometimes. We put the <laughs> shows together, and it all works. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it. This whole idea, this whole we've had so many guests on in on the show over the last few years mm -hmm. around this area of the human trafficking that yep. happens here in Atlanta, and it's one of those things where it is hard to wrap my mind around the size and scope of mm -hmm. this issue. Yeah, and it's one of those things where you feel like you heard about it, um, you've had you know, you've had discussions about it. And you think about it in a certain context, mm -hmm. and we've talked about, it, and we've talked about it on the show when the, yeah. right before the Super Bowl, we made a point mm -hmm. to, you know, when we were in our other home, we reran some of those episodes yep. in order to make sure that we're bringing that issue to the forefront because we know that there is an explosion that happens around these large sporting events or these large um, conventions, conventions yeah. that happen in town and that kind of stuff. It is really interesting, and I'm really interested, and I'm going to have a lot of questions for Scott mm -hmm. about the idea that his work is focused specifically on Delk Road, mm -hmm. that there is enough stuff happening on Delk Road, on Delk Road, that a whole organization yeah. can be. So they're not even just talking about, oh, we're going to tackle human trafficking in Metro Atlanta. No, we're just going to focus on these like three yeah. city blocks and there's enough to do. Mm -hmm. Five it's, days a week. They're five working. days a week. It's on something outrageous. And I yeah. kind of feel like I'm on a little bit of a soapbox. This is outrageous yeah. that anyway. Well, that's so. and, that, and that's in pseudo like suburban. suburban yeah. But and that's, you think about even rule, you know, kind oh of out where where I live, which I guess I guess is probably called. But, you know, exurban exurban. Uh, so and, and you don't have probably the network of organizations right. that are working there, but you might even know it exists because there aren't streets where people are walking or on or let alone. They're just, so there's not and these hangout spots, but you, there, it's happening. It's just happening in places that you don't even know. And like, that's you know. something too that we'll talk to Scott yeah. about. Like what, because like I said, I, you know, in my neighborhood, I live in a suburban area, not too far from where, you know, what are you talking about? And there, you know, and even talking about, you know, with Raphael, it's like, it, where I live in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. I live in the suburbs there. You don't see homelessness in the way that you would in the more inner parts of the city. But I'm sure things are happening there yep. and there are signs. What should 
concerned citizens be looking for? And not in the sense that, oh, I want to call the police and get a whole bunch of people in trouble, Mm -hmm. but being aware of what's happening in your community and stop this whole idea of not in, what is it? Not in my backyard. NIMBY. NIMBY. Mm -hmm. NIMBY. That people don't believe or they don't have to care about these issues because you don't think they're happening where you live or that your kids may not be impacted or, you know, Oh, they are. And the, and the thing, remember, we had the one um, organization on that was saying one of the the main areas or places that they target um, beyond schools is at church. Absolutely. So, you know, the sex travelers, I mean, church. <laughs> and the more you learn about this, the more yeah. you um, are outraged. Mm-hmm. And then also, really, I mean, it's in the news every day. We're seeing these stories yep. that are coming out and we're hearing about these things. And I, you know, somebody was talking about the other day that these folks focus on a certain type of child, Mm -hmm. people who don't have networks, people Mm -hmm. who don't have, um, that there might be some other stuff going on so they're not telling people what's going on. It's incumbent upon the rest of us to to be able to start to recognize some of these signs and what's happening and being aware of what's happening in our community so that we can be of help. Again, not to be like, oh, well, we want to call the cops and get a whole bunch of people in trouble. Right. Especially people who are being victimized. Like, that's not what what we're talking about. But I want to be able to recognize that house over there has a lot of really strange Mm -hmm. stuff happening in it. And is that something that I might want to keep my eye on to see, like, what's What's happening over over there? there? Or if somebody, if later at some point something happened, you're able to say, well, you know what? Yeah, I can be aware of what's happening. So. Anyway, I'm, get up <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm just kind of on a kind of, kind of passionate about that one. I'm you should, just, you should go volunteer with Table I'm, on Delk. I know it's right I mean, in it. They have things like five days, days a, a week. week, and and the 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 interesting thing about it is it's um, Scott and his wife, yeah, and volunteers and a bunch of volunteers. It's it's Wait, outrageous. Yes, I'm just, I'm I just irritated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm irritated by this issue because I just really do feel like it's something that. It's there's it's happening too much for people just yeah. to not be aware of, and it, I'm irritated with myself because I don't feel like I know. Well, you'll know. Now right? I'll when know. That, now you'll know. Now when, I know. When Scott comes at at the bottom of the show, we will all know. Um, but before he gets here, we're going to talk to Raphael yeah. and talk about the Gateway Center, um, and you know their partnerships, which I think are really unique. Um, and he's going to dig into that. But then also, I mean, they're one of the larger larger organizations who are doing this, and uh, and there are things that. Um, uh, the way that they approach it is very interesting because they're giving the people that they serve a choice, which I think is very, yes. um, it, it's very client centered in, in a way that um, is, I think nonprofits are moving there now, mm-hmm. but we always haven't been there. We always, no. You know, there's, Hey, there's an issue. Let's go out and solve it versus let's go talk to the people and see what their issues are really. Yeah. She might be trying to solve for something that isn't really the issue. So putting the people that you are serving first and in the middle of the solution and then letting them help you build it around there. So uh, I think that's a great approach. Um, And I'm glad that he's going to come on the show and talk to us about all of the services that they offer and then talk about how the partners are working with them, because that's the thing. They're all in in one big collective. And I think that's an important piece of the way nonprofits work, but particularly for their mission and their model about how they're delivering the services because they're delivering them in a collective way to make a a bigger impact Um, and not doing things that they don't do well. Yeah. And I think most good nonprofits who figured it out, who've stayed around, who've Mm -hmm. lasted, realize that if you stay in your lane and then you build your coalition that you're able to, you know, one of the things when you start getting mission creep and all of that stuff, you know, that's why Goodwill, we don't do some stuff that folks maybe think we should. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We don't, we have a very clear focus, but we have really great partners. And I think that's something that um, the Gateway Center has figured out. And then also, Yes, that whole client focus yeah. thing and asking people what they want and letting them be a part of their own solution mm-hmm. um, is great. And, you know, I'm sure it makes for a much more successful yeah. outcome. So we it's should the, be a good the, show. It's the in and out burger of <laughs> it's the in and out burger of nonprofits. Wow. We have See, huh? Animal. What is it? Animal style? What is it? Oh, well, they do have animal style, but yeah. that's like, yeah. But, but, now but see, In-N-Out Burger, they have a burger. Right. You could get 
two patties or you can get one patty. <laughs> but that's all you get. <laughs> or I think you chicken. can get three. But do I don't think that. No, they don't have chicken well, as far as like I five know. Five Guys. You can get hamburger, you get hot dog. Yeah. It, but it's a really say, good hamburger and it's a really good hot dog. And you see where. But it's not as good as a Sam's hot dog. <laughs> well, and and I'm sorry, but Five Guys is nowhere on there no, on the I, in and out. Here's yeah. what. <laughs> sorry, like that's that's just my personal. That's, However, that's your West Coast both of those, All all those organizations, you think about it, they do. They're blowing up. Like you, in the last few years, you've seen Five Guys like everywhere. I'm obviously going to Five Guys on my own. <laughs> like I kind of want a lettuce wrap cheeseburger. But so you do one so thing well, See, and you get yes. and you get it, and you don't. As I talk off camera, yes, you don't divert <laughs> off of those. Yeah, uh, you don't divert off of those things, yes. which is you know. So I don't know, but they keep people going. I will tell you that but their fries are really good too. Their fries are really, good. and you can see them. Make making the fries. the fries from the potato though, like yes. in the thing, like you see the potato cut. <laughs> It's the whole thing. I am. I'm so, sorry for those of you who have who live on the East Coast and have never experienced well, In-N-Out Burger. You have got to go west, and you have to go to California. You have to go. You do. I think I went to like one in Texas, it's and not it was same. like uh, I'm like Can't whatever is a hamburger. So I need to go to California. You and have do. an In-N-Out Burger. In the meantime, I'm going Five Guys on my way home because now <laughs> I want a lettuce wrap <laughs> cheeseburger and a bag of fries. The whole the, bag. Yes, because I love <laughs> the grease what, in it. Yes, I love the whole feeling like you're getting something. Like oh, you get a lot of something. Don't eat then, all the fries. Just get get them and give some to your. What friend. I try not to. What I try to do is eat the fries that come in the cup and try not to eat the okay. bag fries. Okay. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it's I eat the bag fries. Carb on the overload. Way home, yeah. And then I eat the cup fries. <laughs> With my <laughs> Anyways, Anywho. back on uh, with our guests after the yes. break. We are really going to start off with Raphael Holloway and then we're going to get to Scott later. But join us. You're listening to The Good Work Show. To learn more about the show and how your company can tell their story, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Good Work Show. Audience, welcome back to The Good Work Show. We have a really special guest with us. We've got Raphael Holloway, who is the CEO of the Gateway Center. Uh, we have had Gateway Center on, gosh, it's been over a year since you've been on the show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but you were That's calling that. in, and now we got you live and in person. Glad to be here. Yes, <laughs> yes. So um, so for those few people, because Gateway Center is all over the place. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for those few people who may not know what Gateway Center does, Explain to our audience what Gateway Center is all about and what your mission is. Absolutely. Well, first, I want to thank you all for having me again Absolutely. and the opportunity to share about Gateway. Gateway Center is a homeless service center, and I'm specific about calling it a homeless service center versus a shelter. Mm-hmm. Shelter usually um, creates a, a thought of just beds and covering, and it's much more than that. We are an organization that's been providing services to the homeless community of Atlanta since uh, July <clears throat> July of 2005. Um, we annually serve about 10,000 individuals, wow. and that's 1,200 in our residential program where we have 490 beds of housing available. As an organization, what we try to be to a community is a starting point, which is where the name Gateway came from. Mm-hmm. So it's that gateway or starting point for individuals that are experiencing homelessness and just want to maybe get basic needs met initially. You can access showers phone, health care services, IDs, birth certificates. And then through that relationship that's built through accessing basic needs, then you can decide if you'd like to try to secure additional housing, short-term housing or, quote-unquote, shelter beds. And then from that shelter bed, we provide intensive case management that helps with linking people to long-term housing solutions. Mm -hmm. And then we partner with other agencies within the city to provide wraparound supports to our clients. Wow. That's a whole bunch of stuff. Yes. Absolutely. So 490 beds makes you probably one of the largest, if not the largest? Second largest. Second. Atlanta Mission, I believe, has more beds than we do. Okay. But that's that's that's, that's a lot. That's Absolutely. A, yeah. yeah. It plus, plus, and plus, and plus. All yes, the other- that's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, so talk to us a little bit about um, the, history, the history of the organization. So we're 14 years this month. Yes. So mm-hmm. talk to us a little bit about so happy anniversary. Yeah. Thank how you. did it come <laughs> to be? So how did this, I mean, like Elaine said before, everybody knows now about Gateway and all mm-hmm. the good work. and Well, not everybody, but enough people know mm-hmm. about yeah. it. Um, so how did this whole thing start? Well, we have the pleasure of having our history being connected and anchored to a, a, a thought and a concern 
that was initiated by then Mayor Shirley Franklin. At the time, there being a number of homeless service providers in the city, Mayor Franklin recognized that it's very difficult for people experiencing homelessness to access services. Mm -hmm. So she made a request to United Way. United Way convened a group of individuals to make an assessment. What was the what were the best practices throughout the country that ensured that people could have um, improved access to services and thus linked to short-term residential beds. And what was discovered in all the different strategies was a model that was this wraparound model, this mm-hmm. one-stop shop. And so the team gave the recommendation to Mayor Shirley Franklin. She looked at the city's resources, and at the time, the facility that we're in is the former Atlanta City Detention Center, and it was vacant. Mm-hmm. So a committee was put together, some documents were drafted, and <laughs> that launched what is now the Gateway Center. Now, there was a fundraising campaign, obviously, to mm-hmm. rehab the building, to try to soften the look of the building because it was a correctional facility to make it more welcoming and inviting for social services. Mm -hmm. But that's where we got our start. And I'm really proud and excited to um, be the offspring of uh, of an idea to be innovative and creative, to create something new to support people in need in Atlanta. Yeah. 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 I think that's a great story though, taking something that was once vacant um, and, and, and negative, and negative mm-hmm. you know, but turning it into something super positive in Absolutely. a way that people want to come and not people where they want to get away from. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So you, you mentioned short, um, you know, short term homelessness, um, but there's the, there's also chronic homelessness. And, and I think we got into this the last mm-hmm. time we were talking about it. But give us uh, some insight into what that means for people who may not you know, kind of be aware, and they probably know what it might mean, but they may not know all the the ins and outs of it. So in our population of homelessness in the city of Atlanta, which is about 3,000 individuals through our point-in-time count that have been identified, Mm -hmm. some will debate the number, but for the city of Atlanta, that's a close count, and it's a measure that's being used, a way of measuring that is standardized across the country and has proven to be the best way for us to get some general idea of the epidemic here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Uh, So from that 3,000, a lot of people are cycling in and out of homelessness. So we may all know someone that had a 30-day stint, six-month stint. Mm -hmm. But chronic homelessness are those individuals who have had longer um, episodes of homelessness. And so anyone that's had 12 months consecutively Mm -hmm. of homelessness would be considered chronic, but not just 12 months. It has to be 12 months and also with a disability. So oftentimes it's a medical condition, Mm -hmm. positive HIV status, those individuals get prioritized as being chronically homeless. Um, Also, you can have three different episodes of homelessness within kind of a two-year period that totals the one year, and it could also be defined as being chronically homeless. Why that's done, why delineate? That's really a HUD definition Mm -hmm. that is used to help with prioritization Mm -hmm. because the goal is to leverage the sometimes limited resources to ensure those most in need are being helped first. Not that we do not want to help everyone, but if we can address those that are most in need that we recognize will have the most challenges with Mm self-resolving, then we try to identify and target those for our services. Cool. So I think we might have touched on this a little (laughs) bit just with the idea of the wraparound services, but I just really want to make it really clear for folks how – the work that the Gateway Center is doing differs from like what mm-hmm. we talked about, not to diminish anything that any of like the shelters or because mm-hmm. that stuff is absolutely necessary. I mean, it's how hot is it outside right now? Yeah. And nobody wants to be standing out there in that right. heat. I complained about my air conditioner not working and I was like, oh, woe is me. I couldn't sleep because it was hot <laughs> one day, <laughs> you know, but when you think about that in areas, especially here in Atlanta, it's incredibly hot. It's incredibly, it gets incredibly cold. So we don't want to diminish that, but how... Does the other stuff at the Gateway Center differentiate and make it just different? Not better, but just different. Oh, we're going to say, <laughs> going to say better. <laughs> My colleagues, uh, we have friendly competition. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, but we should all be competing to be the best. And yes, that is sure is that our guests that are served are getting the best type of service from each of us. So mm-hmm. what makes us slightly different, I think, um, again, uh, my colleagues in this space would share, is that Gateway was designed to be a collaborative space from the beginning. Mm-hmm. So... This partnership that we have, which is right now consists of on-site, about 12 additional additional service agencies come on-site, schedule 
weekly to be at our location to be part of the fabric of what Gateway is and what we can offer to community. Um, not that organizations hadn't partnered in the past, mm -hmm. but to be a scheduled ongoing yep. partnership, leveraging resources to ensure that really our missions align to have the same desired impact. It was called a wraparound model initially, but it's really a collective impact model mm -hmm. that we're saying that, okay, we know we're going to have limits in how much there will be available in funding. Um, but we can do more together, and that's any community. Yeah, and correct. what I share with uh, our guests that um, reside with us or our new team members that join us is that it's really a village approach. The village is always stronger when, it's, when the village works together. And if we can model that village approach within the organization, the hope is then that we can also demonstrate to others how they can be involved and engaged and become part of that village. Yeah, that's really cool. So so talk to us about what happens when people come to Gateway Center. So, um, you know, so maybe I'm, I'm, I'm homeless. I don't, you know, I have children. Um, or talk to us about that. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it adults and children? Is it just adults? Is it just men? Is it, you know, it's, there's all these things that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so talk to us when someone comes to you and they say, I need help. What happens and, uh, and what do they get when they walk through your door? So the first thing that I would hope for any guest presenting at our facility, the first thing they should get is a sense of being treated with dignity and respect. I think that each of us here could acknowledge that there may have been things at some point in time when you were engaging with someone that you uh, was experiencing homeless on the street that maybe you could have gave them a little bit more eye contact. Mm -hmm. You maybe could have just spoken and acknowledged their presence. doesn't mean that you had to give money, food, or any of those other kind of things, right. but there's just a level of respect that we give people that are sheltered that sometimes our unsheltered community doesn't receive. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I hope that they receive is a sense of dignity and respect. Then you have the option of choice. As I mentioned, our what we call our client engagement center is an opportunity for people to decide where they want to plug in. So it could just be showers. It could just be uh, phone charging or the other services I mentioned. But for those who are ready for change, mm -hmm. you are then referred to our ClearPath program for what is called coordinated entry. And coordinated entry provides you with that initial assessment. We're assessing your needs on if you're chronically homeless or not, what has caused your homelessness, what resources you have, is there a way to self-resolve, and then from there, either linking you with one of the, the beds that we have at our facility mm -hmm. or with our partner organizations and community or other shelters to get you linked into a shelter placement. And so that's pretty much what people can expect. They have choices. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want people to feel empowered, but we also want you to still have a choice. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure that's a big deal. That is mm -hmm. a big deal. You know, yeah. A lot of folks, if you feel if you're in a certain situation, you don't feel like you have choices and options. So mm -hmm. on, on top of giving folks some respect, you're also giving them ways to define for themselves what their path is forward. Yeah. And I like the opportunity, you know, what you mentioned about Gateway where, um, there is an opportunity just to, to come in if you just want to shower, if you just, you know what, I just, because I'm not ready, you know, everybody isn't ready for Absolutely. that. Um, and so I think that's awesome that you, you have those multiple doors mm -hmm. in which you can walk into. Um, so we're going to take a break. We're going to come back, Rafael. We're going to talk a little bit more, um, dig into some of those programming, talk to, um, some of the, and speak about some of the organizations that you partner with because, okay. uh, they've been guests on our show. But before we do that, for folks who want more information, who might want to either refer somebody over, they want to learn more about the work that you're doing, give us your website address and how they get in contact with you. Definitely. Our website is www.gatewayctr.org. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're located to? We're located at 275 Pryor Street. That is South Downtown, right at the corner of Pryor and Memorial Drive. All right. Well, we're going to come back. Audience, hang with us. You're listening to The Good Work Show. To learn more about the show and how your company can tell their story, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Good Work Show. Audience, welcome back to the Good Work Show. We are sitting here with our good friend Raphael Holloway, who is the CEO of Gateway Center, an organization that um, is using a, a partnership, collective impact model to really help um, address Atlanta's homelessness issue and and really giving people a choice and i think mm -hmm. that um i think that is really um smart on behalf of the gateway center but um it definitely um speaks to 
you know, that um, the human centered model and what you're doing, you're, you're, you're treating and putting the client first and letting them make a decision about mm-hmm. where they want to go. So I think that's really cool. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about what Gateway Center does, how you were formed, um, some of the programming. Um, but talk to us. You also you give the people who are coming through your doors in, in your residence and clients an opportunity to give back. Uh, and I think that's really interesting, um, you know, and pay it forward a little bit. So tell us about your your resident intern programs and the ways that you're allowing the folks who are coming to you and receiving services to make that full circle. So we're really excited about our resident intern program. And actually, we just in the past week have made some adaptations to that program. Okay. And so one of the things in that resident intern program is our guest uh, volunteer on site. And so, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a village. And so we're mm-hmm. all responsible for maintaining mm-hmm. the village. And you feel a sense of pride when you also feel a sense of ownership or when you have say or when you're, you know, uh, cleaning certain areas or monitoring certain areas, then it also models for others. Mm-hmm. The other piece that we've done with our resident intern program is to really lift it up. So in the past, um, through this volunteering opportunity, we, through our fundraising, provided the guys with a stipend. Mm. More recently, a new partnership with um, WorkSource Atlanta, the um, Atlanta Workforce Development Mm -hmm. Agency, we've been able to actually turn it into a true paid internship opportunity. fantastic. So we have lifted it up and transformed what we were providing before into structured learning programs. So, for example, we have a culinary training program where the guys go through 10 weeks with us, but as part of that 10 weeks of classroom time and actual work. Mm-hmm. And so WorkSource Atlanta has leveraged their funds to actually pay these gentlemen an hourly wage while they're in the training program, right. which oftentimes was the reason why people wouldn't participate mm-hmm. in the training program because That's you were right. doing it for free. That's right. right. So now yeah. We see that a lot, too. I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So now we have that opportunity for you to not just get a job, Right. But you can now start building plans towards a career, mm-hmm. earn a wage, and it's a competitive wage. Yeah. Um, it's 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 for the culinary program. The guys are earning about eleven dollars an hour. Nice. We're actually about to start a custodial maintenance training program. Those gentlemen will earn thirteen dollars an hour. Fantastic. The wage is based on market, mm-hmm. and to it's about a dollar less than market. But it's mm-hmm. so that when they get hired, they can move forward. That's right. And so we've been able to leverage that relationship to then enhance some of the other private-public partnerships we already had with local hotels, convention centers, as well as restaurants to create a path that not only will you be trained, earn a wage, but can be placed into employment. Yeah. So we're really, really excited about our, our resident intern program and what, how it is evolved to better meet the needs of the guests that are in our facility. See, now, you, now you're speaking our goodwill language. I, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, thought you, I thought you both might like that. Yeah, I hear all these things. So all of these things, and I'm just going to back up something you said before, talking mm-hmm. about the or partner organizations that come in to provide all the different services. So yep. talk to us a little bit about who these folks are and what kind of resources and stuff that they are bringing to the table so that when people come to the Gateway Center, they get a good understanding of who they're going to mm-hmm. actually interact with and for what. Okay. So one partner I'll, I'll emphasize is uh, Georgia Works. I know Georgia Works has been on the show here mm-hmm. yeah, and yeah. they have been a partner at our facility for a number of years. And this job training, for example, is also basically our attempt at job readiness. So everyone isn't ready to mm-hmm. always go right out to work. Mm-hmm. Right. So a great partnership with Georgia Works is that we can now train people who aren't necessarily ready for job placement but they are still our job placement provider. So we do the job readiness and some placement, but they're directly job placement. They have leverage um, relationships with area businesses to say, hey, we have these gentlemen that have been trained by us and they're ready to be hired and we will monitor them and basically deal with any or most of your supervisory needs and issues. Mm -hmm. That's a great opportunity Mm -hmm. for an employer to say, hey, maybe I wouldn't have given one of these gentlemen a job if they just walked in. But I have this trusted relationship, and I know that if there's any issues, Georgia Works is going to step in and assist us with that partnership. Additional uh, partnership that's very important to us that's been there since day one is our partnership with Mercy Care. Mercy Care offers a federally qualified health clinic on site. Mm-hmm. So there's not a reason for anyone that is interested or desirous of health care services not to be able to be connected. So our case managers, 
that's one of the first steps that we know that we try to connect individuals to because if people feel better, they perform better, and then that also allows them to um, be at work, not missing mess, mm-hmm. miss days at work and those kind of things. So I would say Georgia Works, um, Mercy Care, we have other partnerships that I can name very quickly. First Steps is an employment partner. Mm-hmm. We have a relationship with Crossroads Ministries to provide IDs and birth certificates. We work with. And that's a big deal. That's that is a huge, huge that's deal. A bit, and I think that's something, you know, and I don't want to rush past that because if you need a job, you I mean, the first have, thing yeah. that they ask you for is some sort of identification. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've talked about it even within the context of other things. We've talked about folks who need, you know, ID to vote yep. mm-hmm. or, you know, other things. But that, I think, is a huge, it's, you mm-hmm. know, thing for folks to know that they can. And then you also feel like you have something. Though. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, I yeah, am somebody. I am somebody and I can and I can show you. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And so that's a huge partnership. Then also aligned with our wellness efforts. Uh, is the partnership with uh, Back on My Feet, yeah. which is a run club. I think many people are surprised that you know there's actually a run club of formerly or still currently people who are experiencing homelessness that get together 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. They run together. It builds camaraderie. Also, again, strengthens the village, gives that sense of pride, makes you feel really affirmed. You're part of something. They compete in many of the local 5Ks. Yeah, and they sucked Elaine and I in a couple weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, we had, no, we had, we had Nicole, Nicole on the show. On the show. And, okay. Yes, and uh, and we we did the the treadmill a thon. Okay. With the with the Peachtree Road Race. They yeah. didn't talk you into the 5 a.m. run group. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We tried. Yeah, yeah. So but, the partnerships are, are are again what makes us different, as you said earlier. Not that others don't have these partnerships; they really are embedded into how we desire to deliver services and it's really also an opportunity to say to community we're trying to be efficient with the resources that we have right oftentimes there's duplication yes Mm -hmm. what we try to do is ensure that we're not adding or delivering a service that someone else has historically done better at um, and there's no need for us to, to reinvent the wheel and so we leverage those partnerships bring those partnerships in and then we listen to clients we have a client survey that we administer once a month to all of our guests, and we can hear from our guests what would they like to see as a service, and we build those partnerships that way. Additional one that I would just like to point out is with University for Parents has been providing Hmm. a fatherhood group for us, and it's really been, again, transformative to the men who have participated in that group because it really digs in and starts to look at before you can parent. How were you parented to? What is your experience Mm -hmm. as being a parent? Because that oftentimes influences your success or your lack of success at being a parent if you haven't really addressed some of those issues. So, um, again, a wide range of services are available, again, for those who choose and want to participate in them. Yeah. So we got about three minutes left. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, though, and ask you, because you mentioned the client survey, and I think that's uh, a real interesting part, again, going back to putting putting the people that you serve first mm-hmm. uh, and, and designing the services around what they um, what they need and what they say they need. So what are what's one thing that they've told you in that survey that you're not offering now that you're like, boy, I really I hear you and I, I, I'd love to add this service or actually we're going to do it. What's in the pipeline? So one thing, just to be very honest, what they speak to us often about is well, one is food. They want more food. They, the food is, quality is good, but they uh-huh. want more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always number one. Uh-huh. Number two has been um, something that we honestly can't control and we try to advocate for, which is affordable housing. Mm-hmm. So we have a large number of gentlemen in our program. And I'm sorry I didn't mention earlier, on the walk-up services, we service men, women, children, anyone oh, can okay. walk up yes. for services. Yes. On the residential side, in our beds, we only house men. So we refer women and children out to our partners. Mm -hmm. But the men that are in our program are getting these jobs, saving revenue from jobs that either we link them to, jobs that they find, and they can't launch to the next level. And it becomes very frustrating. And so their question to us often is, what are we doing to help them find more affordable options? Mm -hmm. And so we are, or myself and uh, board members and others, do participate in a number of the community conversations, Mm -hmm. task force, and other things to try to address the affordability issue. But I, I think that there are opportunities to tell our story more. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a great um, avenue of doing that to make people aware that if you have residential properties and maybe you want to make that property available for people transitioning out of homelessness mm-hmm. and they can rent it from you at an affordable rate, then 
contact Gateway Center. We would be more than happy to discuss how we can leverage that. Um, but that's the biggest need is their desire to move on, but they're not being resources in the city limits typically available for them. So quick example, if I'm making 12 to $14 an hour, the mm-hmm. rent needs to be seven, about 650 to 800 max. Yeah. That's, That's very big. difficult to find. Yes. Absolutely. In city limits. Yeah, it's very difficult to find, find outside city, city limits. limits or anywhere. To today's, a, yeah. Exactly. Or accessible yes. to transportation to exactly. get to jobs and yes. all that. Yeah, kind you of know, stuff. and, and for, for people just getting back on their feet, they need to be close to work so that they can get there and, and create those habits of doing all of that. Absolutely. And they probably, you know, they, they, again, transportation is going to be a big child one. Child care to, issues, yes. Yes. getting back to child care facilities in time, Absolutely. and then the fees associated with being late. And not having transportation. So those are the, the, the yeah. main things yeah. that we get often is how can Gateway or others yep. help them with accessing more affordable housing? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? That's um, that's a song that we need to sing across Atlanta for a lot of different people. Um, so last couple seconds, give us again website address, how people can learn more, how they can support the work that Gateway Center is doing. Gateway Center is gatewayctr.org. Best way you can assist us is through your time, talent, and treasures. We have a volunteer program with about 6,000 volunteers a year. Your talents, we have skilled volunteer opportunities. Um, so that if you have a specialty that you want to bring, accounting, marketing, graphics, whatever it may be. And then, obviously, your treasures. Um, and that treasure can also be time or money. Um, but funds help the world go around that. Yes. <laughs> the gateway. That's right. <laughs> so, That's um, right. again, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Raphael. And um, big shout out to everybody who is working at Gateway Center. Yeah, yeah. You're listening to The Good Work Show. To learn more about the show and how your company can tell their story, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Good Work Show. Audience, welcome back to The Good Work Show. We are excited to have Scott Williford with us. He is the founder of Co-founder, right? Co-founder. Co-founder of The Table on Delk. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Excited. Yes. Well, so we're excited because uh, you and your wife founded an organization called The Table on Delk. Why don't you tell our listeners and our viewers all about what it is, what you do, and your mission? So The Table on Delk uh, came about for over a number of, of reasons and a number of things that have happened in our lives. But our focus is helping women and children that are either at risk or currently being sexually exploited on Delk Road in Cobb County, just two exits outside of 285. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is so specific. Yeah. So I have like an other questions, but I actually, and this might be, well, it is, I'm going to skip down to the third question. <laughs> That's fine. I'm a little trusty list. Why that, why this organization and why Delk Road? Because I mm-hmm. am unfamiliar with um, what's happening there. So, Tell us. So um, my wife and I have both always been very involved and we've had our family very involved in, in different types of outreach and mission work and, and uh, ministry. And she had been very engaged with another organization here in Atlanta called Out of Darkness, which is the anti-trafficking arm of the Dream Center. Mm-hmm. And uh, she did pretty much every role that could possibly happen inside that organization except for be paid you know, except for being a paid position. Mm-hmm. And she was working with um, uh, what they called the jail ministry, where they went into jails and they would visit with girls that were um, identified as being sexually exploited. Mm-hmm. In those conversations in Cobb County Jail, a girl said, oh, you're that group that goes out on Fulton Industrial Boulevard and talks to people and helps them get off, off the streets why don't you do that on Delk Road? And my mm. wife was like, Delk Road, that's the exit we get off to go to East Cobb. Mm-hmm. And um, what do you mean? And, and she gave some more information. And so over the next several months, uh, God made it very, very clear to us that uh, we were the ones that were being called to go to those people. Yeah. And that's how it started. Wow. Uh, so I know people have heard, and if they've been listeners of our show um, they've heard us have other organizations on that um, that are working to tackle this issue in our community and in Atlanta. Um, and, and just remind everybody, though, how large the scope is, because you mentioned Fulton Industrial. You also mentioned Delk Road. There are pockets um, across our area, unfortunately, 
where, you know, women, children, young boys, you know, men are, are being, you know, trafficked. So talk about how big the numbers are. So what most people are shocked to find out that in Metro Atlanta alone, statistically uh, and mathematically, it's over a $300 million illegal sex wow. industry. Jeez. Just wow. in Atlanta. $300 million. And that's just Atlanta. And, uh, and the other stat that I quote a lot is that uh, the Johns are not flying in. They're not convention workers. 70 plus percent of the Johns live north of 20 between 75 and 85. Wow. Most of 40 something percent of them live between Marietta and Johns Creek. And it's not just Fulton Industrial. It's not just Cheshire Bridge Road. It's not just Delk Road. Uh, I live off of Sandy Plains Road in Cobb County and I drive by three um, exotic massage parlors on six miles of stretch of a road in suburbia in Cobb County. Wow. So it's everywhere and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a bad problem. And Atlanta, it, there's a stat that goes around sometimes that Atlanta's the worst city in the country. But how that came about is they were alphabetically number one one time. Uh, oh, but okay. they are in the top ten. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that, yeah. Or, the, or the worst ten. Yes, that's <laughs> for true. sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I feel like I'm, now I'm just going all completely off track. So just bear with me. <laughs> but so you talked about you know you live in you know suburban Cobb County. I live not far from there. Um, areas in town that I think it's important to talk about because I think we, this issue comes up. I know we've had guests on the past where it was right around the Super Bowl mm -hmm. or it was right around these big events, like you were talking about, these big conventions, and that's where people think when we talk about this issue that it's surrounding those kinds of things and maybe it's happening in different parts of town. But that part which you just shared with us, the, kind of the geography of where this is happening is new information for me as much as we've talked about this issue. So what are things that I don't know what I'm looking for. So like, even if I were to say like, well, i this looks odd or how would even just regular run of the mill folks going about their business recognize a sign that this doesn't smell right. Like something about this doesn't look right in my neighborhood. Well, so, uh, there are organized, um, sex rings, Mm -hmm. that have houses throughout all of Metro Atlanta. And, and they, you hear about them getting busted and everywhere mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Milton to, 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 to Cobb to, to Gwinnett County. But, you know, one thing that, that I now am aware of because we're doing this is that extended stay motels often, often, often have individuals who have um, used their body or are using their body in order to get diapers for their kids. Mm. Uh, so anywhere you have an extended stay motel and a homelessness issue, the women there are at risk and may already be sexually exploited. Um, and so that's one thing. The other thing is that um, massage parlors in particular, uh, when I drive down Sandy Plains Road, there's massage parlors that are open at midnight. Well, no, mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. an appropriate time to go get a massage because mm -hmm. your back hurts. Uh, so you, you can tell that pretty quickly. So that, does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. Cause that's mm -hmm. the stuff that, you know, if you're not thinking about, or you think that you're looking for certain signs, you know, whether things that we are accustomed to, mm -hmm. whether it's the people that are on the side of the street mm -hmm. or in, you know, I feel like that's what people are attuned to and they talk and there's a lot of good signage, I think even in the airports now where they're like telling you certain things to look for. And I feel like those things show up in those locations where people maybe kind of attuned, but I'm not thinking about it necessarily in Sandy Springs where I live. Hi, everybody in Sandy Springs. <laughs> <laughs> but there might be something there where, where if you're, you know, in this whole see something, say something kind of well, one of the time, things that, I don't know that people know what they're looking for when mm -hmm. it comes around this issue. The, the, the reality is, is that both the uh, purchasers of these activities and the individuals are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, this, we live in an over-sexualized society now. Uh, both men and women are, are all tied up about how they look and how they act. And, you know, TV shows that we see today at 8 o'clock with all of our kids, they wouldn't even been on the air 20 right. years ago. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so uh, we, we definitely have this over-sexualized in, uh, in, uh, society in America. And we also, because of that, it's driving appetites and then with always on, always access to pornography and, and those kind of things, people, that's a gateway drug. 
you know, the 12-year-old kid who's looking at porn, that's a gateway drug for him wanting something more when he's 17 or when he's 25 mm-hmm. and he's got the money to buy it. And so uh, the, the, the news that you see and hear a lot about is about the girl that is um, – captured or taken yeah. yes the reality is is that's less than 10 percent of the girls mm. most of the women that have been rescued out of uh, human trafficking or sexual exploitation as we like to refer to it 91 percent, 92 percent of them their first sexual encounter was before the age of 12 with someone that they knew mm. their father their brother their uncle their neighbor their boyfriend mm-hmm. someone that they knew intimate and that kind of introduced them I mean, I know victims, survivors, they, they were victims and now they're survivors, that they were married and pregnant. They were pregnant and then married before the age of 14. Wow. And now they've got nine, 10 children. Oh my and, and they have to continue to, 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 to turn tricks, if you will, in order to pay for diapers. And uh, mm-hmm. so it's survival sex. So it's, it's bad. Yeah. 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 So you, you have a lot of opportunities for people to help. Um, and I guess we should dig into the table on Delk, what that what means. We because um, it is very interesting, and, and I love the concept of how you're approaching it because it's a little different than what people might um, do. So talk to us about how you how you are helping and then some of the uh, volunteer opportunities because there are, there are many ways people can plug in and help. A- absolutely, and thank you for bringing that up. So mm-hmm. one of the things that we wanted to do is it's very relational. Uh, we want people to be loved and feel loved. And so what we tell all of our volunteers is your goal is two things. First is to connect them to the love of Christ. And second is to connect them to resources. But they don't want those resources until they know that you care and that you love them. And so every time we have volunteers come in, it's the first time we communicate. Look, we just want you to form relationships. We just want you to hang out and be friendly and love people. And then they will begin to trust you and trust the ministry so that when times come that we can connect them to Out of Darkness or Gigi's House or or one of these other organizations mm-hmm. that can help them get off the streets, then we can do that. And and to volunteer with us, you go to the table on org, and there's a volunteer click and you can you can come on a Saturday or a Wednesday and, and do outreach with us. You can provide food. We, we have something five days a week right now that there's a meal and stuff uh, in some sort. Now, public kind of sign up and come and serve are Wednesdays and Saturdays. The other things, you can drop food off, but the volunteers there, it's a little more intimate. And so we try to select the volunteers that volunteer there. Fantastic. First step is coming to Wednesday or Saturday. All right. Cool. All right. Cool. And so you mentioned the website. Um, other, of course, because um, this is ministry and, you know, what people don't really ministry takes money. Um, so there are opportunities for people to support you financially as yes. well. So yes. on the website. So um, our number one needs people. People. That's that's the most interesting thing is that we felt my wife and I both felt that we didn't want staff. Mm-hmm. And instead, we wanted 100 percent of the money to go to ministry. Fantastic. So we don't have any staff. And so all of the proceeds that we raise go directly to the ministry. And we've expanded what we offer because of the generosity of the public and generosity of our, our connections so that now we're helping women. We're helping pay for some of those treatment programs. We're helping victims who have come back into society integrate by providing them places to stay and connections and stuff like that. But uh, they can donate for sure. It still takes money. Yeah. Well, Scott, um, appreciate all of the work that you and your wife are doing. It's um, it's it's an honor to talk to you, have you on the show. Um, the Table on Delk, everyone, please go to the website, give, support, volunteer. Thank you so much for stopping by the Good Work Show. Thank you. It's been fun.